Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll inspire Apple to promote us a little. And, of course, you can also promote us by telling people about the podcast on social media or however else you publicize the things you like. You can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. I can't tell you if I'm coming or going. It is Sunday as I record this. I flew home at 6 a.m. from Cartoon Crossroads, Columbus, had about an hour or so at home before going out on an Appalachian Trail hike with some pals of ours. Uh, Tomorrow, I will be getting up crazy early to get down to FDA headquarters for a meeting, uh, getting back late in the evening and then turning around Tuesday for a pharma uh, pharma conference near Philadelphia where I'm going to be speaking. A week after that is a trade show in Madrid. Almost immediately after that, I got a pal's wedding in New Orleans. And after all that, I ought to have an easier time, but for now, things are just crazy. Now, CXC, which the Columbus Festival is known by, uh, was a lot of fun, even if I missed the last day. I got there uh, around 2 o'clock on Friday, um, enjoyed activities there, and on a Saturday, I did get in next week's episode, um, which we had to record in two parts because of scheduling problems. Uh, It's with Jason Lutz, the great cartoonist who recently completed a nearly 600-page graphic novel called Berlin. Um... I also moderated a panel with a past guest, uh, comics artist, anatomy scholar, and massage therapist, Kriota Wilberg, and we're going to turn that into an episode this fall. And in general, I just got in lots of fun conversations with cartoonists and artists and, and past guests, um, guys like uh, Jim Woodring, uh, Liniers, the Argentine cartoonist, uh, Liana Fink at The New Yorker, who has a new book out. Uh, Rob Rogers, the editorial cartoonist who lost his job because of um, some political issues. Uh, Carl Stevens, Roberta Gregory, Aaron Lang, Carol Tyler, uh, my pal Tom Spurgeon, who runs CXC. There's a lot of talking, which is partly why my voice is as deep as it is right now. Um, I do want to highlight just one of them, and I don't want to go too much into it, but Jim Woodring and I had a a really neat conversation about the branch of Vedanta Hinduism that he's studying. Um, We may have an episode about that down the line. He doesn't think he is worthy to discuss it. He thinks he would just punt it to, these are the people who are, you know, really good sources on it. Go talk to them. But um, but we sort of had a good conversation about uh, um, the non-material, I guess. But anyway, for now, I'm back home. I'm sorting through that concentrated dose of art talk while also getting ready for an FDA meeting on drug shortage issues tomorrow. And um, and I'm sort of hoping I I don't mix them up. Now, uh, this week's episode is going to form a triptych with the episodes on either side of it. This is very rare for me because the show normally uh, is so chaotic and themeless that it's tough to say, oh, well, these three episodes kind of snap together. 
But last week we had Ken Krimstein on to talk about his new graphic novel about the life of Hannah Arendt, who fled the Nazis, uh, became a major public intellectual through her work on existentialism, but also made major waves in her study on totalitarianism and her reportage on the trial of Adolf Eichmann. This time around, we have the artist Nora Krug, who has a new book out this week called Belonging, A German Reckons with History and Home. It's from Scribner. It's an amazing piece of work. Um, it's, it's listed as a visual memoir. So don't think graphic novel with comic panels and word balloons. There are a couple of pages of that, but it's it's more than that. It's an illustrated book, but the illustration's wedded to a, a variety of designs and visual styles, incorporating photographs, documents, drawings, paintings, um, all sorts of stuff. But that's just telling you about the visual style. Um, the book itself is about Nora's attempts at, at understanding her family's history and what her parents did or her grandparents did during the war. Um, and through that, she's working through what it means to be German and what it means for her to be German and to have lived in America for 20 years now. Um, it's a really impressive book. She she balances hardcore detective work and personal inventory uh, to figure out her, her family and herself, but she shapes it into a, a really strong narrative. I mean, there's a great storytelling thread through it all and, and a absolutely unique visual flow. Um, and most importantly, she manages not to demean the fate of Nazi victims in the process of doing this. And that last one's a real toughie because it's too easy to to let the Jews and the Sinti and, and Roma and, and gays and all the other groups that were marked for extermination kind of fall into the background when you try to write about, quote unquote, normal German life in that era. Um, to her credit, Nora doesn't let her family off the hook, uh, nor the German people throughout history. She really goes into what it means that they committed this horrible act, not that this horrible act happened. Um, but at the, at the same time, she's giving a measure of humanity to her family members, even while questioning why they did what they did during the war. And, um, and the things she can't find out, the things that there are just no facts for, um, the things she asks questions about too late because for her generation throughout their youth, you don't ask these sorts of things of your family. This will sound weird, but it's a little like when I'm talking to the FDA tomorrow and all these other industry people are, um, we all have to remember to say that, not to say, we all have to remember that the patient is ultimately the most important party involved in the, the whole pharmaceutical supply chain, uh, development, manufacturing, distribution, all that stuff. And it's too easy for all of us to kind of talk about our own silos and our own issues. And at, at least, you know, we want to make sure that we, you know, we keep the key figure who's at the heart of all of our work in mind. Um, because if you go through this whole spiel and you never mention the patient's, People will think you don't care about the patients. You just care about, you know, this manufacturing practice or this distribution chain. Um, so, yeah, remembering the, the the humans at the heart of it all is really important. But there I go, mixing up my art talk and my day job, which I'm worried about happening tomorrow, too. We'll see. Anyway, go get Belonging, a German Reckons with History and Home, uh, out this week from Scribner. In non-U.S. markets, it has a title Heimat, H-E-I-M-A-T. Um, we get into that during the episode in terms of what the word means, what it meant under the Nazis, and what Nora wants it to mean now. Now, as far as caveats go, there was a big one. Um, there was heavy static on Nora's audio channel with the primary recorder. I only discovered this when I got home, and it wasn't there when we started recording, but came on and became impossible to remove. So this episode comes to you courtesy of my backup recorder, the Zoom H2N. Um, I always keep a backup going for exactly this reason. Also, uh, there's a cuckoo clock that goes off periodically. I make a third man reference about it. Um, for those of you who are third man fans. Now here's Nora's bio. 
Nora Krug is a German-American author and illustrator whose drawings and visual narratives have appeared in publications including the New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde Diplomatique, and A Public Space and in anthologies published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, Simon & Schuster, and Chronicle Books. She is a recipient of fellowships from Fulbright, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Pollock Krasner Foundation, the Maurice Sendak Foundation, and the German Academic Exchange Service. Her books are included in the Library of Congress and the Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Columbia University. Her illustrations have been recognized with three gold medals from the Society of Illustrators and a silver cube from the New York Art Directors Club, while her visual biography, Kamikaze, about a surviving Japanese World War II pilot, was included in Houghton Mifflin's Best American Comics and Best Non-Required Reading. Nora's work has been exhibited internationally, and her animations were shown at the Sundance Film Festival. She is the author of the visual memoir, Belonging, about World War II and her own German family history. She is an associate professor in the illustration program at the Parsons School of Design in New York City. And now, the virtual memories conversation with Nora Krug. I'll tell you, that was one of my weirder conversations. I did a live episode with the um, uh, for the, the Goethe Institute with the guy who did that book, uh, Look Who's Back, uh, oh, yeah. uh, Timur Burmes. And it was him, a uh, Holocaust mass culture scholar and uh, Liesl Schillinger, this translator, literary person who sort of connected us all. And I was under the impression that Burmes was Jewish. And that, as a Jew, made it more permissible to write a comedy about Hitler coming back to the present day and nobody realizing that he's actually Hitler and not an actor. When I found out he was Gentile, this guy really changed things over the course of the interview. Yeah. I just, you know, it's one thing for Jew. And Burma's like, but I'm not Jewish. I'm like, well, that certainly changes things. (laughs) And then it became a part of the thread of the conversation. When is it okay to make jokes about Nazis as a Mel Brooks, as race on Mel Brooks and, you know, that, that sort of humor for Jews, it's okay. For Gentiles, we're just, it's always a problematic area. But. Yeah, that's why I think in Germany there hadn't been any, you know, humorous take on that, understandably, you know, for a long time. And then, what was, um, God, I, I'm always getting titles wrong, but there was one, Hitler kind of spoofy um, program or film that somebody made when and then I felt like okay they they now you know it, it all happened while I was away so I, yeah oh when downfall was turned into all of those parodies yeah. or uh, what what's I don't know the German name Untergang or something like yeah. that um, when that was all those parodies of of the the bunker spiel of Bruno Ganz yeah yeah you can kind of laugh although the funny thing when I asked that question of the panel. All of them were German speakers, so none of them found it funny because the subtitles didn't make any sense. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe (laughs) it's the ugly American. You know, that's where I'm coming from. Yeah. So I guess to start, when did you know you had a book as you were were researching? Um, Well, I actually only started the research after I had decided to write a book. The book became the excuse for me to um, feel... And title is probably not the, wrong, the right word, but, um, you know, I for many, many years I felt like I didn't have the right to tell a story about the Second World War from the point of view of a German, because mm-hmm. I didn't want people to feel like I'm trying to say that Germans suffered too, or that um, I'm making excuses, or I'm explaining why certain people made the decisions that they made. Um, so for a long time I carried around this subject of war, but I only addressed it um, in relation to other people. Um, so American, you know, I made a series of short visual comics, biographical comics on the lives of people who were affected by war, but whose lives are basically wouldn't be considered interesting enough to the general public to be told because um, they were neither war heroes nor victims or resistance fighters or um, major war criminals. And I was really interested in war affects people on a day-to-day basis, and especially people who uh, live in the gray zones of the war. But I always felt like, you know, I had to do it about 
people from other countries. And then I realized that the whole reason why I'd been making these short biographies was because the war or the memory of the war had been so deeply embedded in me as a German growing up and that I was just interested in the subject of war in general. And then my then illustration agent, Teresa Shelley, said, uh, why don't you make a book about your own family and about the war? And uh, then I, you know, thought about it for a while. And that's when I then realized that there was so much more that I could research than I had been aware of previously. Um, you know, I'd always been going on the narratives that my family told each other, basically. But nobody had really known what had happened or not happened in the family. And so the book then, the decision to make the book um, was the excuse for me to finally ask these questions. Was there a moment during the research where you realized this is the narrative? I mean, you have the four narratives of, of your mother and father's families, but did you have a, a key moment there? The book itself refers to something in your younger days in Italy, which to me seems like the linchpin of there's a whole story here that we don't know about, but was there a key moment like that for you in the process of the research? I think there wasn't one key moment. I think there were many uh, different moments that I'd experienced that then culminated in the urge to write this book. Um, so this story that you're talking about was one that happened in my childhood that I think was uh, important. Um, but I also had many encounters here in New York City living abroad as a German I ended up feeling much more German than ever before, and I think that's probably true for anybody living in another country, is that you suddenly realize how um, much, how deeply steeped you are in your own culture and how many cultural clashes you do experience when you go abroad. And, um, you know, as a German in New York, I was very often asked about the war, um, and I never really had a concrete answer to what my family had done or not done. And um, I, I think had I stayed in Germany, the subject wouldn't have come up so much because we learned so much in school about it, but only, you know, the historic facts. We never asked each other about what our family had done. And um, so I think I wouldn't have been forced in a way, the same way to think, to, to face my own family history in that way. Um, so I think it was probably a culmination of these little experiences I had I mean, one I talk about right at the beginning of the book was when I met, it was at the very beginning when I had just moved to New York City to study illustration at the School of Visual Arts, and I visited a friend at her apartment building in on the Upper West Side, and uh, we went up to the rooftop and um, spoke to each other, and there was a, an elderly woman sitting in a lounge chair nearby, and she overheard our conversation and asked where I was from because of my accent. And when I said uh, Germany, she um, she said, that's what I thought. And then I said, you know, what uh, have you ever been to Germany? And it was, you know, a little naive, but I, um, I, I tried to make conversation, which isn't always easy for a German because we are not great at small talk. And I had just moved <laughs> well, she here. told me before I started recording. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, now I've lived here for 17 years, so I've had some practice, but at the time I hadn't. So I asked, have you ever been to Germany? And then she said, yes, a long, long time ago. And then I realized, you know, after yeah. her silence, uh, because of her silence, that that didn't, um, that there was another underlying connotation there. And then she told me, um, you know, about her own Holocaust experience. And, um, and then you stand there as a German and you just don't know what to respond because... It's not like I hadn't ever been confronted with it, but being confronted with it by an individual who has experienced it and being, you know, this memory physically embedded right in front of you. And um, also, um, it just felt like the present and the past were merging all of a sudden, and it was so unexpected. And yeah, I mean, I, there was nothing I could say. And that was a very, and that was 16 years ago, and I never forgot that experience. And that was just, it stayed with me ever since. And I think that was one, one of the propelling reasons for me to also write the book. Did you feel, in a sense, um, lucky generationally that your parents were born after the war, that, you know, you didn't have the immediate family question of what did you do? You know, it goes back to the grandparents, but that's a, you know, a level removed. Is it, did you have that sense growing up where that was um, most beneficial in terms of, well, at least I know my parents weren't, you know, participants in this? 
Um, it's interesting. Uh, I've never. Th- I mean, I have thought about it. I've ha- I've thought about it. What it means to what it meant to my parents and my parents' generation, and how their experience was different from mine. I mean, in what way is it different to have to ask yourself these questions about your own parents? But sometimes I wonder if it's actually easier because you know every teenager questions their own parents, and in a way, maybe it felt almost more organic to have it both happen at the same time, you know, this natural questioning of your parents. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think I felt lucky, but I did I did often wonder in what way it's it was a different experience for my parents than it was for me. Mm. Yeah, was there that um that sort of pendulum swing from some of the Germans I, I know there's a sort of well, I would say almost generational uh, balance of either collective guilt or we're tired of this collective guilt we need to shrug it off and, and look to the future uh, did you did you find it um, did you experience that I suppose as you were growing up have you seen that in subsequent generations yes I mean I have a, a lot of friends who do feel guilty you know this abstract paralyzing sense of guilt that's not necessarily related to their own family but to being German mm-hmm. and um, it's very difficult to shake and maybe it's you know maybe that's okay um but um i the other perspective i have a problem with you know saying that i'm tired of feeling guilty i think that's that's dangerous and i think that's also what's currently being used by some in germany as an excuse um to then um uh, support their you know right leaning ideas and ideologies um, and I think the same thing is happening here. You know, I'm tired of feeling guilty for what, you know, I mean, yeah. we did to the slaves. And, I, 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 you know, one should always continue talking about these things. One should always face what we have done in the past. It's our responsibility. And then the question is just, do you just remain guilty in a paralyzing way? That's, of course, not a good solution. And I think that's what Germans were more on the left uh, wing spectrum have a, a difficulty doing you know they feel just paralyzed by the guilt and I think uh, our educational system was partly to blame because I think they didn't manage to teach us how to um, how to use this uh, this guilt in a more constructive way and I think interviewing our own family would have been one way of doing that because then you would have felt like you are playing an active part in actually asking questions and facing up to your own family history and writing about it and talking about it and thinking about how you can use that knowledge and experience um, for the present and to, um, you know, help shape, contribute to shaping a, a tolerant society today. But I think we didn't do that. We were just, and I think whatever we learned and however much we learned about the war and the Holocaust was definitely completely important, and I think we should always continue learning as much as we did, and future generations should. Um, but it should it should be paired with a different kind of, um, you know, experience, educational experience. Is there any parallel to how East Germans were raised for their their education with this? I've heard smatterings of stories from friends of mine who know people who came up under that regime during the Cold War. Uh, for whom, for whom the model was, we as Germans brought this all on ourselves, and that's why the Russians had to come in and, and annihilate things. And their knowledge of culpability about the Holocaust isn't really there because it's much more focused on what they did to the, the Russians, um, which is a huge overarching question. But uh, since it doesn't come up in, in belonging, is there a, a comparison with how East Germans were, were raised with this? In your experience, um, you know, I really gr- grew up in the um, very far southwest, mm-hmm. uh, basically half an hour from France, and we didn't have any family in the east. So I uh, can only speak about this from the perspective of someone who's lived in Berlin for a few years, and you know, I have some East German friends of my generation, and I do know that um, their experience was completely different. I mean, we were, you know, occupied by so by by such a different. Um, uh, you know, country, different countries with completely different political ideologies and worldviews, and of course that completely shaped who they are in, in a you know different way than I was shaped 
And um, yeah, I, I have I have spoken to friends from that generation who grew up in the East and who don't understand why I feel the guilt that I feel. Mm -hmm. And um, they, you know, without being, you know, leaning towards the right or anything, they just feel like, well, why do you still have to feel like that? They don't understand it. And, you know, I think they went from one ideological system to another and there was probably not the same amount of critical you know, self-critical engagement mm -hmm. uh, in the educational system. But yeah, I can only speak to that from the experience, um, you know, from just people I've met. But um, one thing that I have observed across, um, you know, um, states basically within Germany is that I think a lot of Germans in my generation feel like everything has already been said about the war and we've learned everything in school. But then, in reality, the war is so deeply embedded in their consciousness. I notice it whenever I go back, when I'm on the train, overhearing conversations, when I'm at, at the bakery in the morning, you know, all these snippets of conversations you hear, and there are so many references to the war. And, yes, sir. Um, you know, it's often paired with uh, self, um, you know, there's this deep-seated, I think, uh, insecurity that Germans still have about themselves as a nation. You know, we have this expression that I grew up with that's um, called typical German. I write about this in my book. Yeah. You know, that's so typical German that, that it means narrow-minded, um, stubborn, um, you know, overly serious. And... Um, yeah, I, I still hear that expression a lot when I go back to Germany. And um, yeah, I can't really think of, of, of a more... Yeah, well, when I went back for the um, World um, Cup, uh, Soccer Cup in 2016, I think. Yeah. I forgot. Um, there were, I mean, you know, every city is different. But in Berlin, I saw so many anti-German references from Germans. Uh, you know, on cars, I saw stickers that said, Germany, no thank you. Um, people don't sing the national anthem at kickoff when, you know, before yeah. the game begins. And Germany won that game, uh, I think. And oh, when, the one where they demolished Brazil? Yeah, yeah and yeah. they won, I think, 7-1 seven seven or 7-0 seven yeah. against Brazil, which was the host country. And the presenters on TV were really far from cheerful about it. I mean, they, you know, they said, uh, you know, let's not get too elated. And so there's this strong sense that we should not come across as arrogant. I mean, we often do, unfortunately, but, uh, <laughs> what are you <laughs> do? <laughs> but, um, and, um, yeah, so I think, uh, I think there's a deep, deep insecurity that's still in our heads. And I think, and the book came out in Germany about three weeks ago, and there has been such a strong reaction to it, positive reaction. Um, that confirmed my suspicion that most people, while thinking there wasn't much more to say about it, actually feel like, well, there's so much more I should research about my family. I mean, I've gotten a lot of uh, messages from people who said, you know, your story really touched me and it reminds me so much of my own. And um, yeah, I mean, it just confirmed my suspicion. And that, to me, again, just speaks to the fact that we should always continue talking about these things. There, is, there should not be an end, but not because we should remain self-hating Germans, but because we, um, you know, that we, we just have to face up to our past and continue thinking about how it uh, might impact the future, especially now that, you know, with the stuff happening in Chemnitz and in other cities, I think we have that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Besides the, the German audience response, how has your family responded to the book? Um, well, I'm lucky, very lucky in that regard that I have a very, very supportive, uh, open-minded family. Oh, I thought you were going to say there's nobody left, which is my lucky thing. But anyway, go go on. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, there's nobody left on the grandparents' generation. Yeah. So, yeah, that was probably lucky for me in terms of writing the book because I didn't have to worry about what my grandfather might uh, feel about my writing about him. I mean, you know, maybe he's yes. <laughs> looking down at me from somewhere, hopefully not looking up, yeah. but down. <laughs> but um, but so, uh, and my parents, you know, nobody in the family tried to stop me from doing the research um, that I was doing. I think everybody became really interested in what I, what I was finding out. And also my parents' generation didn't have the same tools that we have now, uh, you know, technological tools to do the kind of research that I am doing. 
you know, at archives, I mean, there are these U.S. military files um, from the post-war years that you can now look at that you weren't able to look at for decades. I think first they were basically owned and locked away by the Americans and then by the Germans, and now they've been made uh, public. I mean, you know, only uh, close family members yes. have the right to look at the ones from their own family, but, um, you know, you did, my parents didn't have that um, that opportunity, so they really felt very curious about what I might find out about their own parents. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like a detective? Yes, and I love, you know, I, I love detective work in general. I, yeah. I'm sometimes uh, I, I get lost sometimes online, and you know. You did, yeah. You, you did allude to a couple of rabbit holes that you, yes. you go down, online. but for the most part, you managed to <laughs> keep that out of the, the text itself. Yeah, but I, I do think the rabbit holes say so much about the general questions. You know, I feel like the little narratives that you that you come across on those websites, which some of which were really kind of dubious, and uh, you know, I did wonder what what kind of people go on them usually, and. Um, um, you know, I think they, they say so much about the general problem. So I think, I think going down the rabbit hole is a very important part of the research process. Get creeped out at all by the Nazi aficionados yeah. who can identify everything perfectly in old photos? Yeah, very much so. Okay. I mean, you know, I, I'm not a, a professional enough to know who are just these I suppose it's mostly guys, but I don't know who. It's guys. Yeah. It's got to be guys. <laughs> <laughs> who get who get really um, excited about you know the design of the badges and uh, and who are but whose political opinion is basically more or less decent and who are those people who secretly admire that stuff and you know dress up on the weekends. And... It was my I guess my second trip to Frankfurt. I have a trade show that goes there every couple of years. I uh, went to Nuremberg for a couple of days beforehand just so I wouldn't be in Frankfurt, which I consider one of the more boring cities I've ever been to. You don't have to speak up in case it's going to offend anyone. Um, but traveling by train, uh, looking out at some farmhouse and seeing a U.S. Confederate flag flying in the yard, I had this moment of, huh, wonder what that's all about, and looked it up and discovered that that's the code for we can't fly a swastika. Oh, I didn't know that. We'll yeah. I, I mean, it's not such a big leap to make. No, it's yeah. not. It's one of those, oh, that makes sense. You are a supremacist, therefore you use whatever flag you're not going to be banned from, from flying. It's almost like my first, <laughs> and this will sound horrible, uh, my first trip to Germany, which I had a lot of issues with. My first day there, I was in Ravensburg, and a, a kid comes walking out of a pharmacy with a, a shirt that said Gegen Nazis on it, mm -hmm. with a big fist coming down on a swastika. So, yeah, against Nazis. Yeah, I didn't know that. And, oh. yeah, see, not speaking German, I was, huh? You know, just, just looking over, like, on my phone while the, the PR person is driving me around trying to figure out what it is. Um, discovered, yeah, it's a it's an anti-Nazi, yeah. pro-tolerance movement. But apparently... Um, the French don't know that either because there was a German-French uh, friendly soccer match where in, in France where the Giga Nazis crowd unfurled a huge banner in the stands and uh, found themselves being beaten by security because oh they God. were pulling out a swastika flag in the middle of France. Luckily, their lawyer got them off um, after they were all jailed for it. But, um, but there is that sense, I guess, that, that question of American approach to this stuff versus post-war German approach of banning, you know, the, the sale of Mein Kampf and any distribution of it versus, you know, putting every idea out there and just letting them, you know, rise or fall. Is that something you'd ever dealt with or, or considered in terms of especially the, the visual and graphic language in terms of illustration that you do, um, the validity of banning something versus kind of addressing it and putting it out there? Um, I didn't have that question when I started this rant, but I got to it. So yeah, <laughs> no, it's a good question. Um, you know, it's interesting because in general, I'm uh, really in favor of publishing annotated versions of things and then um, placing them correctly. So in other words, for instance, I grew up reading Tintin in the Congo, but yeah. in Germany, it was just at the time. I don't know about now, but it was just in the. It was just standing in the in the in the children's you know section along with all the other Tintin um, books. And in England, I think because there was an exchange student from the Congo, um, 
was that in England? I forgot. Uh, complained, and after that, um, they. I might be getting that wrong. I don't uh, know. Yeah, if it was but, in but it was. Uh, yes, yeah, didn't say France or Belgium, but anyway, yeah. it's. But yeah. then after that, it was um, annotated and not sold in the children's section along with the other Tintin albums, but in the adult section. Mm -hmm. That to me is the best way of doing this. Uh, I, I'm not, and in America, I think it's been banned. Um, so I don't think that. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure published. what the status of it is. Yeah. But, yeah. And um, so I am. I think I would probably favor the British approach. But that said, um, with something like the swastika, I think in, in Germany, it had, you know, it, they always have to have a sticker on them. Mm -hmm. It's a cuckoo clock. Sorry for the interruption. Um, German. Okay. <laughs> um, We're Swiss, really. I can go back yeah. to the third man and all that. But anyway, go, go on. <laughs> and um, so I often go to flea markets in Germany because I'm interested in the stuff that emerges there. I'm not interested in prop propaganda material, but I'm interested in seeing what things are sold at contemporary German flea markets um, from the war years, um, you know, that say something about the personal experience of the war under the Nazi regime. And whenever I go to these flea markets, I see people, you know, selling books from that period, and they always have a sticker on them. And sometimes there's a sign that says, you know, for education purposes only. I mean, still, you don't know who ends up buying them. But... Um, but I think uh, that's really important personally with a swastika. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i so indoctrinated in a, in a positive sense, uh, you know, regarding the swastika. I mean, I remember when I first moved here, and in Germany we don't have ceiling fans uh, because, you know, now we get the same temperatures that New Yorkers get, but we didn't used to. Yeah. But I remember lying in bed, sometimes waking up at night, looking at my ceiling and thinking it's a swastika. I mean, I was so... This symbol is so deeply embedded in my fabric as a German that I, I just always had this association. Um, and um, so I think I'm in favor of that. But it's interesting uh, because you mentioned Mein Kampf. I had never read it because, as you mentioned, it was forbidden in Germany. And then a few years ago, while doing research for, for this book, I went to the Brooklyn, Univer uh, Brooklyn College Library, which is close to here, and I saw two copies of it on the shelf, and I was, um, you know, initially shocked. I mean, I knew it's available here, but to see it, you know, in the flesh, I, you know, had never seen it. And uh, But I didn't pick it up because I felt like even touching it, almost like I was going to get a disease yeah. or something. And then now, recently, I felt like I, I, I should know now what the book says. You know, it's, it's my responsibility, especially after having published this book um, about this time period, I, I, I need to know what he wrote about. And so I asked my student assistant to pick me up a copy from a library here, and I opened it up and started reading it on the subway the other day, and then I saw that there was a Hasidic woman sitting right across from me, and, uh, you know, she didn't, she didn't look at it, she didn't, yeah, I don't but... think she noticed, but then, of course, you know, this is, these are those moments where you feel the clash, it's almost like a time machine, and you feel like, oh, you know, the present and the past are connected. You, you, you don't live in a, in, a, in a political vacuum. You don't live in a historic vacuum. You are always, you always represent the past, your, polit your country's political past. You can't ever separate yourself from it. And you have a responsibility uh, because of that. I mean, that's true for anybody from any country. And, you know, that's something that a German living in Germany just wouldn't feel. You know, I have been asked in interviews... Um, since the book came out, you know, why do you feel awkward speaking German on the phone to your parents sitting on the subway in New York? Well, I don't feel awkward when I do that in Berlin, obviously. But if I read Mein Kampf on the subway and there's a Hasidic woman across from me, I mean, if, if you're yeah. German and you've never been in a situation like that, of course you don't know what it feels like. So, you know. Well, I was going to say, living in Brooklyn, at least, you, you get a fake Kanausgard My Struggle cover and put that over it in that way. <laughs> and in Germany, you know, it's not called Mein Kampf, obviously. In Germany, yeah. it's just called Love. You know, it's just the subtitles. Oh, they, yeah, they yeah. Okay, I yeah. was wondering how they got around that. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime I can make a Kanausgard joke in Brooklyn, I feel like I've really succeeded. So. <laughs> uh, but what was the challenge of, of shaping this, of shaping belonging? into a story or into the, the multiple stories that are there? It was a big challenge because it encompassed so many different times in history, so many people I wrote about, so many experiences I had, my family had, um, you know, especially uh, mixing the present with, with the past uh, because the book is not only about trying to find out what my grandparents did or my uncle did, but find, trying to um, figure out what it means to me and how it has impacted my 
family over generation. So it's as much about the present as it is about the past. And weighing those two uh, was challenging. And, you know, I'd never written about myself. Uh, you know, I was a little um, uncomfortable with that, not because I felt like, um, you know, what can I reveal and what can't I reveal, but I just, uh, it, it, there was, you know, this worry of, yeah, I didn't want to feel, to come across self-involved or anything. You know, I, I, there was a timidness about mm -hmm. writing about myself. And um, and so that was that was a challenge too. How do I... And then, and then you look back at your entire life and you have to kind of edit your life down as if it's somebody else's. So gaining the distance to your own life, I think, is something that probably everybody who writes a memoir is struggling with um, because you have so many memories, but not all of them are relevant for a book, mm -hmm. obviously. And so I had to kind of put, a, put on this filter and look at my own life um, from the point of view of somebody writing this book and editing this book. But I had, I come from a documentary film background, so I, um, I think that experience um, has helped me a lot. You know, editing, as you know, is a very important process of any, any, you know, any uh, creative endeavor you make uh, in terms of telling a real, a true story. And um, so I think that's helped me a lot, that experience. Mm -hmm. We talked about the German audience response to it and your family response. Jews? And you're married to a Jewish man. So, so that's good in terms of being able to pass it by him and all this. But has there been any response from Jewish readers? And how the, the meta question around that is, how difficult was it for you to write this without devaluing the real victims of the Holocaust and still tell a compelling story without ignoring you know, the, the greater horror and tragedy that went on around them? I think that's where uh, you know, husbands and uh, our wives and editors and agents come in. Um, Are you saying I, they're all Jews? Is, I'm just kidding. That's the... Well, actually, <laughs> a few of them it's a are. Actually. But it holds up. Yeah. <laughs> but um, um, you know, and it was important for me to get the perspective of Jewish friends and my Jewish husband. Um, you know, on this, obviously. Um, but uh, you know, I passed by the material early on to my husband and to my agent, Alex Jacobs, who I deeply appreciate, and to my two editors here at Scribner, um, Lisa Mayer and um, Kathy Belden. And I think they both really helped, um, you know, you know, weigh, weigh this carefully because, of course, my biggest fear, and that's why I hadn't written a book like that in, in a long time, you know, why it took me a while to overcome this, um, you know, this hesitation to write a book about this in the first place, was to um, come across as somebody who's trying to make excuses or, you know, say that the Germans were victims as well, which I don't want to say at all and which I'm not thinking at all. Um, and I also don't want the book to come across as um, an apology or uh, trying to ask for forgiveness. That's very important to me too, because um, it is unforgivable what the Germans did. And um, it's something that um, is just deeply disturbing, uh, continues to disturb me deeply, that, that human beings are capable of doing something like that to others. And um, so, yeah, it's not it's not an attempt of asking for forgiveness, and I, I state this in the book. Um, and so, uh, my hope is that it won't be misunderstood as such. And it's not out yet in America, but it has been circulated, you know, among librarians and booksellers and book buyers, and no, yeah, book booksellers. And so, um, uh, reading some of their reviews online has made me um, realize that you know all of them so far have. Um, have said that um, exactly because they're Jewish and you know they have this own family history that's deeply embedded uh, in them, they were very um, interested in hearing this point of view and um, you know touched by uh, you know kind of being able to, to, to follow this journey. But uh, that's not to say that um, you know some people will feel differently, and sure. of course that's not everybody needs to feel about the book the way they want to feel about it and not everybody has to read it obviously I mean yeah. you know. well in, in this world people can rage about things without ever reading the material <laughs> That's true. so we have that to look forward to uh, was it a, a real tightrope in, in that respect in terms of trying to, to do this in a way that was honest, wasn't devaluing wasn't you know explaining and forgiving I mean was that really the, the, the 
true challenge behind it as opposed to the detective work and everything else and the, the various trips back? I think it really depended uh, on the moment in the narrative. Um, I didn't always feel like with every page I had to walk this tightrope. And the thing is also I didn't want to write a book that um, wasn't deeply felt and honest because mm. I, you know, there's no point in writing a memoir if you can't be honest. I mean, it just doesn't come across as sincere otherwise. Um, so I, um, I needed to make sure that I'm still expressing my, my inner feelings while making sure at the same time that I'm not miscommunicating. And, um, you know, there were moments in the book, for instance, when I came upon this uh, U.S. military file about my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, and found out uh, about certain aspects of his life that I hadn't known, known about. Um, I almost had these two voices in my head, and one was the voice of a German saying, oh, you know, um, he was, you know, he was one of many and he had to... It was the time he yeah, had to... Yeah, and he had to look after his family. I'm not, I'm not saying that all Germans feel like that or, 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 or think that that, that's, that should be the way to approach our past, but that was a German perspective. And then the, the other voice was um, maybe more my American voice that said, oh, but anybody who made this decision should not be looked at uh, in a favorable light. And then the German one came in again and said, but he was your grandfather. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was almost like I had this argument in my head the whole time as I was reading this file. And I probably also was thinking then already, how am I going to write about this? Um, and so, you know, the whole research, pro research process was for me um, an internal struggle of trying to um, test my own limits for my empathy for the decisions that my grandfather uh, made. And um, another thing that I, where I felt this tightrope very clearly was um, in these instances where I had to think about how to weigh text and image. And there's this one moment in the book where um, I read the letters for the first time that um, my maternal grandfather's brother wrote to his wife, who was Swiss, um, from the front line in Russia. And he had no interest in, in fighting in the war. He, um, there's no moment in, the, in, in any of the letters where he writes anything positive about you know, the Nazi regime or the Nazi ideology. All he writes is, I want to come home, and will I ever see you again, and um, will I ever be able to taste the vegetables you pickled for me in the basement? And um, and they're really the most heartbreaking love letters I've ever read. And of course, I went into reading them feeling like, oh, but you shouldn't feel touched because he was a German soldier, and who knows what he did. Um, but then I read them, and I was touched, so I couldn't obviously claim that I wasn't. So the question was, how do I then talk about the fact that I had these emotions that I tried so hard to control beforehand? Um, and, and then how do I pair that with an image? So I work with landscape photographs a lot in the book because I wanted to move away from the more traditional graphic novel format of panels and speech balloons because I didn't want to um, show myself in the book too often. I didn't want to show myself sitting at an archive, looking at my grandfather's file, right. talking to my mother. I, wa I wanted to treat it a more... Well, in a sense, it's like a documentary film with voiceover yeah. at that point. Yeah. You're doing a, a visual collage and yeah. an audio. Yeah, so. and I, I love documentaries, and so I, I, I think what inspired me most... I think I was actually more inspired by um, essayistic documentaries than I was by graphic novels, um, even though there are many graphic, no graphic novelists who I admire. But um, I think, uh, yeah, that because because it, it allowed me the freedom to to treat the subject uh, more openly, more poetically. And so I think of these landscapes a lot as inner portraits or, or, or as passive portraits. So um, I'm also, you know, a big fan of. Sorry. No worries. Of nonfiction writing um, and that type of nonfiction, you know, creative nonfiction that's um, that's poetic and talks about emotions, but without being too direct, obviously. And um, so landscapes to me um, uh, portray that that inner emotion. But then I struggled for a long time, you know, with what landscape image I should choose for that moment where I read these letters and where I talk about my feelings about. Um, you know how I felt about what my my grandfather's brother wrote in them, and because had I chosen a landscape with a you know the sun going down, that would have been so horrible and inappropriate because then it would have looked sentimental, and you you can't tell a German war story 
in a sentiment, sentimental way. It's just a huge mistake. And so, and you know, you know, you, you have the same challenges as a filmmaker in talking about the subject. What kind of music, you know, instead of you know, you can't use music on German television on a German documentary about the war that is heroic. And whenever I go to England and I turn on the TV and there's a Second World War, you know, documentary on, it's a kind of music that we could never use for yeah. the same exact film. Mm -hmm. if it were made in Germany. This is the exaltation exactly. and triumph. Yeah. And so I struggled the same way with the images, and so that was, you know, that was another instance where I felt like, okay, how do I walk this tightrope? Well, when it came to, to both writing and, I would say, drawing or even composing the pages, because drawing really isn't an appropriate term here because of, of the, the graphic styles you employ, what was tougher? Uh, how difficult was it to A, to, to write this, B, to figure out the, the visual modes? In addition to things like that, you do have sections that break out into panels, but even there, it's not a conventional comic style. The, the word balloons are sort of in the background to the exposition, and you know, there's, there's a number of different uh, tools that you employ. How tough was it you know, developing those and figuring out which ones were appropriate for which sections? Um, so you are asking specifically about the images now, or are you yeah, well, the, the writing the, as well? The, the balancing of images yeah. and text, which is going to lead into my great question of how did you translate it into English, given that the German words are so much longer, and, and that with those those balances you have with some of the other compositions where the images are right in the center, uh, things have to get broken down. But anyway, that's a logistic question down the line. Um, but yeah, that, that question about how you develop the particular, or decide on the particular styles that you are going to be employing. Um, I am somebody who works quite slowly, and I think part of it for that is that I um, I always immediately doubt what I'm doing. Um, so, so I think there is some Jewish attribute. <laughs> <in that. laughs> Do you have anxiety a lot? That, that's really yes. our thing. But yes, yeah, either you go. <laughs> yeah, um, I haven't taken the DNA test yet, but who knows? <laughs> um, and uh, so the. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm also somebody who, you know, I, I work chronologically because I want to basically follow the narrative through, through the book the same way the reader would. So I basically began on the first page and ended with the last page. So that was my work process. Um, but with every new page, I mean, I had nothing planned out. I mean, I, I spent two years entirely on just the writing because I needed to get the narrative structure down and there's no... Uh, no sense in, in, in beginning to draw if you have to scrap half of the book again in the end. I mean, it would have taken me 20 years instead of six. But I, um, so I, I did the writing and then sometimes in, in my Word document I would write little keywords and say, I will probably put a comic book page, um, you know, po comic style page here or I will probably use a family photo here. But that often changed. And so I just worked myself uh, from page to page without knowing what was going to happen next. And of course, it, you know, I had to always see them in context. You know, I, I I didn't know what was going to come two pages from now until I knew what was going to be the next, you know, what the next page would look like. And then I often, um, yeah, I made the decision based on what the writing was about. Um, you know, if the text was particularly emotional. Um, I try to use an image that uh, was a bit more toned down because I wanted to avoid um, sentimentality. Um, sometimes when I talked more about historic facts, you know, what happened in my hometown when the Sinti and Roma were deported or, um, you know, then I chose to illustrate those particular moments because I think we... Uh, we, I wanted to create an emotional entry point into those historic moments that I think you don't get by just purely reading facts. So then I was more illustrative. Um, and then it also depended on the material I already had. For instance, um, certain family photographs that to me seem to um, possess a symbolic value. Um, you know, there's one where my aunt, uh, as a two-year-old looks up at my grandfather and she had very, very blonde hair, really the only person in the family who had blonde hair and blue eyes, but um, she, and she was wearing a white dress, so there's something almost angelic about her, and she looks at my grandfather, up at my grandfather, and he's wearing a hat and 
I think part of his face is in, in, in the sh you know shade. <clears throat> and um, on that page, I write about I, I quote her because I after I found this U.S. military file about him, I told her about what I found, and she was a little more defensive of the decisions he made than my mother was, for instance. <laughs> and so this photograph seemed perfect to me because she looks so she looks so innocent in this image, and she, also the way she looks at him admiringly really seemed to symbolize to me that um, this is still her talking about her father. Uh, and so sometimes I, I knew immediately, okay, this photograph conveys, uh, you know, I only used photographs in the book when I felt like um, they really spoke for themselves, not because I had a photograph, but I, they had to have a particular meaning for me for me to, to use them. So that's how, how I made the decisions. Hmm. Um, but to your other question about the writing, uh, I actually wrote the story in English first, right. and I did that uh, consciously because um, because I needed that distance from my own culture and country um, in order to feel like I could write about it. And I also had really had a, an American readership in mind for this because, yeah, because I would not have writ written this book if I had stayed in Germany. Um, and because I wanted to, in, in a way, I wanted to answer for myself primarily, but also for all these people who've been asking me about, you know, what did your family do in the war? Um, I wanted to answer their questions. And then I, um, I translated it for the German edition. And now, you know, it's coming out in 10 languages this year and last year, uh, next year. And so every different language has its own challenges, you know, because I have to oversee the design for each of the editions. Which is, I guess, what I'm asking. Would some of those German words end up running out to two or three lines? Yeah. In those images. It was a big problem. Yeah. Layouts where the picture yeah. is spreading the, uh, the, the column of text. I mean, yeah. I've been, I've been working now with a Dutch, French, and German designer. I mean, I just finished the Dutch edition um, on every single page because, as you say, you have, I mean... It's very much, a, I say, unitary work, but each each page is a, an item in itself. In terms yes, of I mean, if there were a grid that's spanned across the whole, throughout the whole book, then yeah. I could say, okay... Um, you know, I have um, the, 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 the layout, the, the, the text designer would already know, okay, this type, this style of text in this box. I mean, you'd still have the length issue, but um, but here, you know, the text has different colors on each uh, page. It, it runs around the images in different ways on each page. So I really have to art direct every edition, and it's an incredible amount of work. Did you think of that when you were laying it out? Did that occur to you? I mean, I, it occurred to me, but I too late to do it. The okay. <laughs> I tried not to think about it. And then in, in the German edition, I had to I had to shorten some sentences. That's where I was coming from. It was one of those moments of this is it has to fit completely and, and perfectly in order to, to wrap around these images. And when you have thirty five letter words like that, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, German stereotypes you do and don't live up to, given the, the um, typical German thing. Are there things you look at and think, ah, oh, God damn it, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm still a German. Yeah, I'm, I'm terrified of uh, missing deadlines, definitely. I mean, I... Show up an hour early for somebody's interview? Is that what you're saying? I'm just kidding. Yeah, I know, I know. I was probably... <laughs> you were more German than me today. It's sad, but you But, um, no, I... Um, I feel a tremendous, I mean, probably not every German feels that, you know, but I feel, and I think I was raised to feel that by my own family, but a tremendous sense of responsibility when it comes to meeting deadlines. I'm probably also afraid of making mistakes. I think that's a very, very German thing, and I feel that every time I come back to Germany. Uh, Germans have a harder time apologizing to each other, I think. Um, I mean, even when bumping in, into each other on the street, small things like that, but also bigger things. And I think it's, I mean, I don't want to blame everything on the war, but um, I can't think that the war has nothing to do with that um, because we, you know, we made such a huge mistake once that we, I think we're terrified of making mistakes again. But I think it goes back even further to the Prussian times and maybe even before then. But this feeling of, you know, and I think the perfectionism comes in there too. I think perfectionism is the fear of failing. And I think that's, that is deeply embedded in me. So to do the, the psychotherapy thing and to get me over my own anxieties and crippling aspects of this stuff, how do you get over the anxiety of the blank page? Um, I mean, I, I really struggle when I write uh, and draw. 
But, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the only thing you can do, and I always tell that to my students, is sit down and continue. I mean, it's... Get over your dramatic heritage and, and make something happen. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, there, and nobody... That's the beauty about our profession, I think, but, or any creative profession. Um, but it's also the extremely difficult thing, is that nobody can tell you how to do it. I mean, there is no one way of doing things. And if you try to do it the same way other people do it, I think you're not doing favor you're not doing yourself a favor so the only thing um the only way of finding out what the solution is to sit down and do it and i think i have a few things that help me like you know drinking coffee but also listening to uh, plays for instance um you know uh, i love the bbc so I spent probably years worth of listening to the BBC while I was working. I mean, there's this wonderful thing called the BBC iPlayer um, radio, and they have just hundreds of plays and comedy shows and political discussions and book reviews. And I just, and you know, somehow distracting my ears at least while I was working uh, helped me focus on the page and get over this. Oh, depression of feeling like, oh God, am I ever going to finish this? And what am I doing here? What do you learn from teaching? Um, it always depends on the students, but yeah. uh, <laughs> um, what do I learn? Uh, I think. Well, what did you have to learn? I suppose. Yeah, I, I think being really, really open to a multitude of, you know, I hate the word style, but. Um, ways of thinking and working as an artist. I feel like as a teacher you can't just favor one type of illustrating or storytelling or looking at the world and I, um, you know, I've, I've probably become more interested because of that in a variety of different ways of working and thinking and telling stories and more, um, yeah, more open in general. Um, and then also you have, to, you know, every student is different and comes into the classroom with different challenges, both as artists but also as persons. I mean, when you teach at an art school, you always get a clear sense of also what the students are struggling with as human beings, because most of their work is about their lives, which is challenging for the teachers too, but it's also wonderful because it can get so fulfilling for both in a way. And yet you're not their therapist, so you you know, yeah. you don't want to pretend you are their shrink or their parent or anything like that. So you you know, there has to be a certain professional distance of course. But um I think I've also learned to to work around those sensitivities and you know, how do you uh help them figure out their problems? Uh, I mean or you know, in the in the in the visual realm, you know, overcome exactly this blank page problem because every student or oh, has the different mechanisms of doing so. So you have to listen to them. You have to uh, hear what they say about what's worked for them in the past and what hasn't, and then try to develop a strategy with them. So I think, yeah, being more open and listening more. Um, yeah, I think that's probably what I've learned. Mm -hmm. And you came to illustration somewhat late in your your education and background. Is it something you wish you had focused on earlier, or do you think the again, documentary and the other um, media in which you worked ultimately helped inform who you became as an illustrator? Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many ways of becoming an illustrator, and I think there's no one way that's better than another. But um, I think it's really better that it worked like this, that the way it did for me. Um, I mean, I went to a music middle and high school. I was seriously pursuing studying classical violin. I was interested in acting. I was interested in um, Japanese, uh, you know, culture and language, um, psychology. I mean, I was there was just no end to things I was interested in. And I struggled for a long time figuring out what I really wanted to do. And then I applied for the school that uh, Paul McCartney founded in Liverpool in 96. Um, that was for musicians and artists and actors and dancers. And, and so I thought, you know, this will help me figure out what I want to do. And then it confused me even more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, then I yeah, got into documentary film, even though nobody taught it there. I don't know how that happened. Um, and documentary film, but also music, I think, in terms of pacing and rhythm and... Um, yeah, documentary film in terms of editing, interviewing techniques, um, how to pair images with words, um, all this really helped me. And I think had I 
only drawn. And I, I'm also somebody who's never kept a sketchbook. I never tell my students that because I always tell them they have to have <laughs> No, no, one. kids, you need to keep practicing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I have never done that um, because I... To me, illustration is really a way of communication and of telling stories. So um, it's uh, to me, it's never been about the medium. Um, it's always been about what's the best medium to tell a story. And um, so, yeah, to me, it's not about the act of drawing itself. Uh, I don't really get so much satisfaction from that. I mean, I can enjoy it occasionally when I'm drawing, but I never draw unless I have, I'm embarking on a, on a really, you know, new serious project basically. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think had I been somebody who had only drawn, maybe I wouldn't have thought of it as so much as a storytelling tool, but more, more as a job or, uh, or, something. Yeah. Or, or, or as a, um, or as a, um, just something that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. which probably would have been nice but um yeah you know as a maybe 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 the technique would have been more in the foreground and not so much so I think we could play the german stereotype of joy versus utilitarianism again and you know <laughs> no this is just a tool that i use to achieve my goal <laughs> instead of you know, having fun uh, are there other media you want to work in and are there ways you could see belonging being done in other forms um i mean certainly i you know the one um the one medium that I feel like, you know, that I always thought, oh, I wish I could have used that is music. And obviously, you know, with this type of book, that's not possible. But I, uh, yeah, I mean, animation, um, I could have imagined it to be, uh, you know, in some sort of film film form. Um, but I also, uh, my U.S. publisher, Scribner, just... Um, uh, I just did the audio book for them. And uh, when they asked me, initially asked me whether I wanted to do that, I was, you know, surprised because I thought, how how can you make this book into an audio book? Um, and I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. And then they convinced me and then they asked me if I wanted to read it. And like most people, I don't particularly like the sound of my own voice. And I thought, oh, my God. And then I did it. And now I really am glad that I did it. And I, I was interested in seeing that we only... Uh, rewrote a few pages and that a lot of it actually did work without images. I mean, I don't, th you know, I, I think I will want to continue working in the n visual nonfiction realm, but, um, but it was interesting to see that it also worked, um, as a, yeah, as a purely text based, um, project. But the nice added thing was that, uh, we were, when looking for some music to play at the beginning and at the end, you know, for the credits, um, or we could come across in the in the um, public domain, uh, you know, vein where these horrible Oktoberfest uh, poker, you yeah. know, that were completely inappropriate for a book about the Holocaust. <laughs> yeah, <thanks. laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, then I uh, I introduced my you know the, the audio book producer to uh, this um, group of friends I have in Germany who studied at the same uh, music high school as I did, and they're called Barbershop Six Pack, and they uh, have been recording these wonderful old German folk songs that uh, Germans of my generation don't learn, partly because, you know, we kind of denied our cultural her heritage entirely after, you know, after the war. And uh, it's only because of them that I grew up knowing these old German folk songs. And uh, so we asked them last minute if we could use two of their wonderful songs, and they said yes, and now we use them, and that finally I was able to get some music component into the project in some way. And both songs about, are about leaving your home, and I've noticed that a lot of German old folk songs actually are about that, having to leave the place where you come from. And to me, there's a great symbolic, some symbolic value in that because, you know, I left my home, and this book is all about having left my cultural heritage behind because of the Nazis and what they associated. You know, the... What is home to you? No, oh, that's always what the Germans have been asking me yeah, now that the book came. <laughs> <laughs> I figure it's, it's one of those standard questions, but no, it's an important one. And, uh, you know, in German, uh, in all the foreign language editions, the book is called Heimat, which um, doesn't only mean home, but it means it describes the, pr the place that you feel most emotionally 
connected to and um, it usually really also goes back to your childhood you know even to smells that you associate with home to the food that you ate certain kinds of landscape so it's something that's deeply embedded in the fabric in your fabric but also in your family's fabric and um, you know because I grew up with such a conflicted um, relationship to my home country or all Germans the word Heimat has actually been shunned for decades in Germany because um, because the Nazis misappropriated it to use something, you know, to support their racist ideology. So uh, Germans have not been comfortable using it, but in recent years it's become really popular again. And I think part of why that was the case is because of globalization and the fear that comes with it that um, there is no national identity, you know, and eventually will be left without any sense of national identity. Um, but also because of the um, challenges of the recent immigration waves that have happened in Germany. And so the right-wing uh, fraction has been claiming it for, for themselves. And so my German publisher and I were initially against using it, but then we thought, you know, maybe we have to claim it back from them. Maybe we have to say Heimat is not something that um, is a concept of a pure cultural identity that is static and has always been the same and should always remain the same, but something that is that is shifting and has to shift and has to look, be looked at critically over and over again while still being loved. And um, so, you know, that's why I named the book Heimat in all the other foreign editions, because to me it means, you know, we have to continue talking about our troubled past, but we also have to learn to love our country, because I think a lot of Germans still can't do that. And then, unfortunately, includes myself. You know, I still struggle with that. The book has not helped me overcome my uh, complex feelings towards my uh, home. Um, and I still don't know what Heimat means to me. I think, to me, it really is something that can only be found in, in memory. Um, I strongly associate it with my childhood, walks that I took with my parents uh, in the forest, collecting mushrooms, you know, eating liver dumpling soup for an American. It's probably not a very attractive <laughs> thought, but um, going to the vineyards. Um, so I, uh, you know, that's what I associate with the term. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think we need a sense of, of, of Heimat or of home, home and of belonging. I don't think... I can just say, you know, my home is here now because I live here and, uh, you know, most of my friends are here now. I think it's not as simple as that because I do think that our childhood, um, you know, impacts us in a way that no other time in our life does. And so um, I do think we can't deny, you know, we can't deny where we come from, I think. But I think to me it's more of a question and I don't think I've found the answer. Do you have the long form bug now that you've you've done this? You mentioned the next project. Or what could be, you know, what you work on next in creative nonfiction? Are you thinking of, or are you in the middle of a longer next project? I'm not there yet because I have to still do these other foreign. Sure. The and you know, promotion and all that, and weird guys from New Jersey showing up with microphones. <laughs> no, I, you know, I still need to, some time to decompress. But um, I do definitely want to stick with the topic of war. Um, I don't know if it's going to be the Second World War. I don't know if it's going to be my own family. Probably not. But war, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, told through my own lens. Um, but uh, yes, long form, definitely. But I also want to think about other opportunities of doing short visual essays, maybe in between, that could include photographs and uh, illustrations, or maybe only photographs and text. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to stick with the subject of um, how you know our histories shape us and continue to shape us, and basic, basically politics in, in the widest sense. Last question: Poison mushroom shirt. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Yeah. That's funny. Uh, again, as a Jew who's constantly uptight and afraid that everybody is an anti-Semite, I was a little concerned based on, you know, that, that portion of the book. That's but. interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I should probably not bring that on my book tour to Europe. Uh, <laughs> Just saying. To. Um, yeah. Uh, it's only now that I realize looking at the cover that that's the shirt you're wearing on the cover oh, of the book, Oh, my too. God. I wasn't even thinking about that. 
Yeah. So you're saying you're no, anti-Semitic as well. <laughs> here I was, I was uh, just for the people who are not seeing what I'm wearing, I'm wearing a red shirt with white dots. And that's also the uh, female character on the cover of my book is wearing a red jacket with white dots. And the poisonous mushroom is a recurring theme in the book. and um, Which is a euphemism for the Jews in the pre-war Build up. Um, yes, on the one hand, it is um, because one of the horrible stories that is told in the book is um, my uncle, who was uh, a member of the SS. He was 18 when he died. Um, he um, he kept a, you know an an exercise book or several exercise books uh, in school, like most children did, and he illustrated it with both with flowers and charming little, you know, animals and stuff like that. And then right next to it, the swastikas. And um, one story is called The Jew, A Poisonous Mushroom. And it um, it compares um, Jewish people to poisonous mushrooms. And it was, I think, a theme taken from uh, an anti-Semitic children's book that was circulated by the Nazi party at the time. And um, so I pick up on that theme of the mushroom because it has such symbolic meaning to me and, and my family because it, you know, because he wrote this story in his book. And um, yeah, so now I'm wearing this shirt. Yeah, the I'm... red with the white polka dots, which um, I forget who it is had to to dress like that for. A, a oh yeah, concert. my mother. Who was it, your mother? But that was yeah. I, I you know that the I mean the. The pre-war, and people now don't associate it with anti-Semitic stories in contemporary Germany, and before that, uh, they didn't either. I mean, that's that's one as, of... As Jews, we find a way to associate everything with anti-Semitism, <laughs> well, trust and the, me. <laughs> well, and the Nazis, you know, they reappropriated, they misappropriated, um, you know, that, that was that's yeah. why contemporary Germans have such a hard time loving their culture, because... So many Nazis, things were yeah. used for that purpose. Exactly, mm-hmm. and uh, but they also picked up on 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 you know anti-Semitic stereotypes that had been around in Germany for centuries. I mean, you know, it's not it's not only that they put that meaning into certain things; they also you know picked up, um, for instance, you know, for centuries in Germany and other other European European countries too. But um, uh, you know, there was this uh, recurring visual theme of a, a Jewish man in obscene contact with a pig. And it was applied to church walls in the Middle Ages, and um, Martin Luther used it in some of his books as illustrations. And, you know, the, the term Judensau, you know, Jewish pig, was, you know, derived from that. Right. And so, you know, but, uh, yeah, the mushroom in Germany before the Nazis came along and after, I, up, you know, to my knowledge, has been a, a symbol for, for luck, a lucky symbol. And, um, yeah, so I didn't mean any harm by wearing this shirt today. Fantastic. Understood. Nora, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. And that was Nora Krug. Her new book is Belonging, A German Reckons with History and Home from Scribner. It's out this week, and as I said at the top, I'm awfully impressed by it. Now, Nora's website is nora-krug.com, and that's N O R A. Dash K R U G dot com. Uh, there's lots of good stuff there from Belonging and her other books and illustration work. She is not a social media fan, but she's trying. Uh, you can find her on both Twitter and Instagram as Nora Krug, N O R A K R U G, with no dash. After we wrapped, I asked Nora, So, who are you reading? And, as you may remember from earlier in the episode, she has trouble remembering individual titles, so it turned into a little bit of a challenge. But, still, if you want to hear her answer, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The newest episode features book recommendations from last quarter's Virtual Memories Show guests, including Stephen Heller, Dean Haspiel, Jaime Hernandez, J.J. Settlemeyer, Michael Kupperman, Ilana Meyer, Christopher Brown, Irvin Ungar, Alberto Manguel, Chris Reynolds, and Dave Calver. You could support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I have all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project that I'm being guilted into getting back to, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. 
Now, I recorded this episode at Nora's home in Brooklyn. It was an epic ride on the two train from 95th Street out there, um, but it's a flat rate. So this one cost $12 at the GW, 30 bucks for parking, $6 for the subway round trip. Oh, and another seven fifty at Nagel's Bagels for a Fat Elvis bagel and a coffee. The drive home was a nightmare, but um, this is why I do what I do. So if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, and a Fat Elvis bagel, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. Now, special thanks go out to Joe Caruso, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizek, Paul Karasik, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Jack Les Camella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samaroff, Stephen Solomon, Craig P. Steffen, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, Noah Van Skyver, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memory Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with the third in our World War II Germany triptych. And it features a conversation with Jason Lutz, recorded this weekend at Cartoon Crossroads Columbus. Jason is the author of the 550-page, 22 years in the making, graphic novel, Berlin. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll help us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way.